We'd like to welcome everyone to our Bible study this evening. Um, I'm not sure if we have a clown or a, <laughs> someone from a kid's show or something over there. For those who can't see, someone got a hold of Cowboy, put a bunch of makeup on him, and put bows in his hair. Ain't a bird in that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But we're going to uh, go on and begin. Uh, today, we're going to get into uh, chapter 11, starting with verse 7. Uh, this is the two witnesses of Revelation getting killed. Uh, we touched on last week uh, who those two witnesses very well may have been. I use that in a past tense form. Uh, there's a lot of uh, views as to who they could be future. And I'm not going to say that you... that that. The way that I'm presenting it is that you have to believe it, but uh, we, we did establish who these two witnesses were, and we're going to elaborate on that as we get into what happens to them uh, with their death and what that symbolized. Um, but before we begin, we'll call on uh, Pastor Kathleen to open with a word of prayer. Father, we ask you to go before us and teach us the way through this book of Revelations, a book that leads into many paths according to many different thoughts and things. And Lord, we just ask for confirmation and verses of the Bible revealed that will help us to understand the book of Revelations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Revelation chapter 11. And if someone could read verse number 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now what's interesting is that the beast has not ascended yet. This shows that the book of Revelation is not giving things in chronological order. The beast is actually introduced two chapters. Hence, he is not described or mentioned previous to this. He's being spoken of here as being one who, uh, or I should say, spoken of as being one we know who he is. But actually, in chapter 13, the devil calls the beast up out of the sea and he is described and explained. But here, we're given a foreglimpse of the beast before he's in introduced. The bottomless pit is where demons are incarcerated. So this beast is something that is demonized. He comes out of there and he makes war against them. And it notice it says here he is allowed, he's allowed to overcome and kill them. You catch that? Now someone read verse eight. The bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is let's see, which it is figuratively called Solomon and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. Now, this is a reference to Jerusalem, of course. Though my impression is, it's not saying that the church will lay in the streets of Jerusalem. R rather, it looks to the world that the church is dead and it's connected in their minds to having killed Jesus. The death of the church is like another death of Jesus, but not exactly. Again, this is what kind of vision? Literal or symbolic? symbolic? Symbolic. The church does not actually die. It appears to be dead. Now, I realize that these two witnesses are dead here, but the church doesn't actually die. The church will never really die. But the time may come when it will be subdued, conquered by the beast that comes out of the pit. And it may appear that it's dead. When you look at what's going on in the condition of the church right now, 
The church is alive and kicking. But worldwide, does it look like it's alive and kicking? No. Not really. Barely alive. Right? When the church is allowing what it's allowing and allowing <coughs> homosexual uh, ministers to rule over the ch in the church and allowing couples to get married who are the same sex inside the church. And if you call them out and say that's apostasy, you get ostracized. Does that appear like the church is, is strong and, and fruitful right now? Does it look like the church? That, what, what about in 2020? Did the church look like it was alive and strong when the governments came in and said only essential Places can be open. You have to close. I don't think there's anything more essential than the body of Christ coming together to worship. People were terrified to go into a church building, but yet they would go in a in Walmart with three or four hundred people with a mask on and buy their toilet paper. <laughs> weren't afraid to go in Walmart. Because in China, the church is so alive, underground. Why didn't the people go underground with their church? If that was so important not to go in the building. Well, if the church is half spiritually dead, then it's going to think that the government has more power than they do. Now, I just throw that in as a, as a reference. I'm not saying that we're living in the time of these two witnesses being dead, but it's possible right now that it appears that the church is dead. We know that the real body, the real remnant in the church is alive and kicking. And we're awake. We know what's going on. We're not blinded. But the ones who are just going along to get along... I don't know if they even know what's left and what's right, which is which. What's front and what's back. What's up and what's down. They don't know. They're dead. Now, let's go to verses 9 and 10. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies <clears throat> to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, how did now notice it says these two witnesses are actually called prophets? Okay, how would you think that they tormented those who dwell on the earth prior to this? The real church has done what? Told the truth. Right? The real church has told the truth. And people who did not want to hear the truth, who ended up having to hear it, that would be their torment. Were these two people dead when they were tormenting people? No, no. Know. What it's saying here is the reason they're rejoicing that they're dead is because prior to this, the ones that are dead tormented the people. How did they torment the people? With the truth. With the truth of the gospel. People who wanted to stay in their sin. People who did not want to change. People who wanted to live like they wanted to. When they saw grandma coming, they ran. They were terrified. They didn't want to hear that stuff. Because they wanted to live like the devil. Yeah, or at least the truth. So it is the message of these witnesses that was a torment to their consciences. Because there are people out here in the world who are the worst people who were raised in the church. And you can't tell me that one of the reasons they're doing drugs and one of the reasons that they're drinking drinking is because their conscience bothers them that they're not where they should be. They try to drown that torment with a substance. I'm not saying that applies to every situation of people who backslid and left the church, but I would say that it probably does represent a good percentage. 
They've been tormented. And if they see that the church has crumbled, the church seems to be dead, they're happy. <laughs> All them old uh, goody two-shoes can't, can't judge me now. Look at their condition. They were wrong. I'm right. I can live like I want to. Hallelujah. Except they're not going to say hallelujah. I don't know what kind of a uh, acclamation they'll, they'll make. But yet, in, as we get into verses 11 and 12, these two witnesses are resurrected. Let's read this. 11 and 12. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies saw them. Now the way I was taught when I was a futurist is that these two witnesses may be, uh, may be Moses and Elijah or Enoch. Okay? They're going to prophesy for three and a half years in Jerusalem. They're going to be killed by the beast, who is the Antichrist. And when he comes up, and they're literally going to be dead in the streets of Jerusalem, and no one's going to bury them. Everyone is going to get excited and send each other gifts like they do at Christmas time. And then the whole world will see them stand to their feet and rise to heaven. That's what I was taught. And you probably have heard something similar. <clears throat> They even say that this could have never happened, and I said, alluded to this, I think, last week before television. Only uh, now that we have satellite coverage of the whole world that we can watch events on the other side of the world in real time. Because of technology, this now could happen. That the book of Revelation has anticipated television. I've, I've heard, was it Robert Schuler that said this? Or was it Oral Roberts? One of them. Oral Roberts said it. He, he you know, actually prophet, oh, revelation and prophesied to te television because of this. They actually get enthusiastic about this. They say this is another confirmation of science in the Bible because it says that everyone in the world will watch them rise. What are they trying to get us to picture? That these guys are dead. No one knows that they're going to rise. Yet for three days... The television cameras are going to be glued and aimed at their dead bodies. Does that make sense? I don't think they'll do that. At the moment they rise, just so happens, everyone will be at their television set watching. <laughs> Even the villages that don't have power will somehow see this. Maybe a rerun. Everyone is infatuated with this scene, even though no one knows that they're going to rise. The scripture said they, no one knew that they were going to rise. If we're going to argue that every person in the world is going to see this, not only is everyone that has a TV going to have to be watching it at that moment, but the jungle dwellers are going to have to hurry up and get a TV too. And they're going to have to get power. To suggest this is about people watching TV is missing the point, and it's not very realistic. What is apparently being said here is after a lengthy period of time, a time that's equated to the whole age of the church, 1,260 days, during the time that the church is invincible, during the time the church is bearing witness to the world, there is little time represented in that three and a half days. Okay? Out of three and a half years, which represents all this period of time of the church age, Three and a half days must be a very short period of time. And during this short period of time, there seems to be a defeated church. But not all are defeated. The church is, rises from the dead and they're caught up in heaven. I take that to be the rapture of the church. Does that sound logical to you? Mm -hmm. In other words, right before the rapture, it's going to appear that the church is dead. The resurrection and the rapture of the church. What it seems to be saying is the church age in general is unstoppable. But a little time at the end of it, the church seems to be defeated. Now let's 
rewind what I said a few minutes ago. And is what I'm saying in relation to the time period that we're now in the church, could we be closer to the rapture than we think? Sure. Very possible. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter 20, we have a similar scenario using different numbers and different figures. In Revelation chapter 20, a thousand years is given, and as I believe is a representation of the church age. But the devil is released at the end from the bottomless pit as the beast for a little while. It says this in Revelation chapter 20. The devil threatens the church, besieges the beloved city, but does not succeed because fire comes down out of heaven. That fire coming down out of heaven, I take to be the second coming of Christ. And what does Christ do? Vindicate his church. The imagery is different, but the concept is the very same as what we're reading here in chapter 11. There's a long time of invincibility for the church. Ever since Pentecost, the church has not stopped. Oh yes, we've been persecuted. Oh yes, the devil has done a lot to stop us. But do you, do you realize that during those years, that, what was it, my say coin, uh, uh, whatever, I can't say his name, the, the, le the, the leader, the... the, the I would say tell him. There you go, that, that, that sounds a lot better than mine. When he was over China, before he took over, China had religious freedom. He put them under religious freedom. Do you realize that during those, what, 50 years that he had control or during that 50 year period before uh, I should say however long he was in control there was almost 90 to 100 million believers that accepted Christ during that period so during his time they had during his time of ban there were almost 100 million believers that came to Christ in his country underground did his band stop the work? I think his band actually increased it. That's what happened. There's something in Isaiah that talks about he would put a... Uh, what's that passage? Can you remember? Um, it said that he would put a standard... You remember that scripture... When the enemy would come, he would put a standard. In Isaiah, I'm using the word that the Bible uses is not standard, but it meant standard. But that's what happens. The church was invincible. But right toward the end of our age, before we're raptured, a short time at the end... There's going to come a time when the church seems to be vulnerable again. And it's going to appear to the world to be defeated by the enemy because of the intensity of demonic influence in the world. Again, I ask you, could we be living in that time period right now? Just the changes we have seen in the body of Christ in the last 30 years. We could be in this time right now. The respect that even non-Christians had for Christians is not what it used to be. The church submitting to the world's standards and submitting to the world's influence and now saying that the Bible, just like they try to do with the Constitution, they try to say, well, the Bible was written to be progressive. It's, it's going to change over time with, 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 with the... With the changing of times, the Bible will change. So My Bible tells me it doesn't change. Isaiah 59 has those That's it. Isaiah 59. 19 and 20. Okay. And that's what happened. Well, look at the Catholic Church today. I mean, yeah. Well, how it has changed. The, the Pope, the Pope right now. Is the Pope we have now is the epitome of Antichrist. He does not believe in hell. 
He cannot change that. That's a doctrine he cannot, he doesn't have the authority to change. If he could, he would. But he does not believe he's a universalist. He believes that everyone is saved. That's why he goes into Muslim countries and kiss the leader's feet. He is a globalist. He himself thinks that the model government for the world is China, and he himself thinks that the worst thing that ever happened to the church is the United States. Those are words that came out of his mouth. If truth be told, as I said before, 85% of the gospel has been spread around the world because of the United States. So to say that is demonic. He he, and 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 I, I there are some things, and because we're broadcasting, I'm I'm not going to go into full detail with, but there are some things about his past involving devil worship that has been uncovered. Downright devil worship, and I'll put in parentheses without saying anything else, the sacrificing of children. But we see this happening now in our lifetime, in our generation. This, these changes have come about. Growing up, you, I, you would have never told me that the United Methodist Church would ever do what it did. John Wesley is rolling over in his grave. Well, who was the, you t talking about Catholicism, the, the Pope that was uh, in control in Reagan's era? Wasn't he, wasn't Pope he, John Paul. Wasn't he pretty, I mean, he was pretty straight, wasn't he? Well, more he straight. was probably more morally straight than the last, well... Benedict was, was probably, well, Benedict had a shady past with Hitler. Um, he was probably more morally straight than the last two we, the one we had and then the one we have now. But even in that, there, there's things, even about Mother Teresa and things that she did, that are not as much as she's revered that uh, would not be an example of Christ. A lot of these people, they had the influence, the worldly influence that they had because of compromise. I'm going to say something right now, and <clears throat> Lord, forgive me. Well, I'm, the Lord won't, don't, doesn't need to forgive me for what I'm about to say because it's true. I'm going to ask the people listening to forgive me if it initially shocks them. I respect this man. And I still will, every time I see a clip of it, I'll watch and listen to what he says. I do respect this man. But even Billy Graham, he had the influence in the world that he had because he compromised in something. You do not get that attention. You do not get that publicity. You do not get that media approval if you haven't compromised. He compromised. And you know what? You can probably go on YouTube and there'll probably be a hundred different YouTube channels that will tell you what, well, how he compromised. He compromised. He had relationship with world leaders because of compromising. If you go back to old Robert Schuller's, you know, the crystal, mm -hmm. he had that show, that television show. He interviewed, there were things that Billy Graham said on live television. You can go back and watch the recordings. He, 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 where do you think Joel Osteen got the idea that there's Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims in heaven in different parts of heaven? It came out of Billy Graham's mouth on the Robert Schuller show. He believed that 
Jesus Christ is was you know he he didn't in his actual belief he did not believe that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven that everybody is saved everybody's saved because of the blood of Jesus well that's cheap grace that's what Billy Graham thought that was now that's not what he thought he actually said it and he it, when he talked to Larry King live he said things like this when he talked to Robert Schuler. You can go right on, look it up, Google it. I'm sure the videos are there. These are things he said on live television. If you go to the Billy Graham Foundation uh, website, I don't know if they're still there, but he, th th he had a magazine called The Decision. Yes. These very things that I'm saying, he said he had articles in his magazine stating these things. And that's why he got popularity with the world and with other religions. He was very, very close to the Catholic Church. He said, I agree with everything that the Catholic Church does. He told Robert Schuller that in the interview. We are the best of friends. So he agreed the Catholic Church didn't need this Bible. They needed their own Bible. Well, he didn't go into that, the, the divisive parts. He didn't, he didn't. Yeah. That's how he could, he got the attention of world leaders and how he could got the attention of all these different world religions and how they respected him because he would not draw his, the line in the sand. Now, and he was a part of a, a very demonic organization. And he was a 33rd, 33rd degree, if that gives you a hint. I'm not going to say on the broadcast what that is. Lane may know what it is. And I, my great-grandfather, one of my great-grandfathers was. 50 years. He had a 50-year pen. And, and, the, and they gave him a, a um, they came and buried him. They did a, a ritual service when, he, when they buried him. So, but see, you can't. If, if you're going to get the stage, uh, it was William Hearst. You know that big Hearst Mansion castle in California? The newspaper man. The newspaper man. Oh, he is the reason why Billy Graham got famous. Billy Graham went to California and did, a, and did a revival. And because they were in the same club, Billy Graham, uh, Robert, I mean, uh, William Hearst put him on the front page of his newspaper. From that point forward, Billy Graham ran like a wildfire. And that's why he got the recognition and the adoration and the respect because he compromised. But God allowed that. Well, you could say he, he allowed it, yeah. He, did, he didn't stop it. But that doesn't mean God approved of some of that. Yeah, yeah, but people were saved. We hope they were sincerely saved, yes. God could have taken something bad and made something good out of it by all the lives that were saved. I am not discrediting the work that Billy Graham did. But I'm just saying. Do you recall this in the late 60s or not? When this happened? This was in 1949 when William Hearst put him on the front page of the newspaper. 1949. The year before I was born. So, again, I'm not here bashing the man. I'm just giving an example of how, how you see how easy the church could, could, could be on fire. And even though it's pressing forward, and even though people are coming to, the, to know the truth and knowing the gospel and knowing Jesus, even how still there could be a dead part of the church. You can't compromise. You can't compromise. He was, he started down at Bob Jones University. Yeah. I've and, always thought that was a cult. Well, but they, you might think it was a cult, but they didn't compromise. No, they didn't. And that's why Billy had to leave, because mm -hmm. he, he wasn't, he wasn't. Uh, he went to Wheaton. He ended up yeah, in Wheaton, yeah, didn't he? Yeah. 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 But, but see, that's just, I'm, I'm just giving an example here. Uh, how and, and see, here's the deal. Even though Christ 
still, what's the word I'm looking for? Projected through all that. The enemy was still able to put a hold into it. The enemy was able to put an influence in that, even though it was good and righteous and things were happening. And the people who personally knew it and was a part of it, they may have been compromised in their faith because of it. Well, if Billy Graham could be part of that organization, I can be. You see? Pastor, what does it say about people who are led astray? That's right. By persons. What happens to those persons that lead people astray? Yeah. But if you get to the point where you're teaching that everybody's saved and that everybody's good and that you don't really have to separate yourself from the world because everybody's going to be in heaven, you're teaching a heresy. Mm -hmm. That's That encourages other things. Well, if everybody's saved, then I don't have to repent of my sin. And, it's, and if I don't do it through Jesus, then it don't matter. Do you see how the influence could go in another direction? That could lead people straight to where? Hell. That's why you don't compromise the word. Because it may not have affected me that way, but the person standing next to me, it might lead them to hell. Well, it's a little Paul says somewhere that the tongue is sharper than the two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what does it else it say? It, it's, it quickly divides... Between And I'm going to put it in common words. It divides between what people perceive you to be and to what you actually are. It'll divide it right down the middle and expose you. The good and the bad. Or what are you? What are you really? You know? But this can happen. And, and it could be that these last 30 or 40 years that we have seen a change in the church... This could be that short time of three and a half days that we're talking about right now. Because remember I said, Revelations chapters 11, 12, and 13 are applying to what time period? The church age. So this is the, the part that's probably the most applicable to us. So if the church age, let's say it's a thousand years, that little time is just a little while. Actually, in all truth, if this is the church age, the church age has been almost 2,000 years. But for most of the age of the church, the church is bearing witness on the offense of taking the gospel to the whole world, driving back the powers of darkness. But in the end, there's apparently a brief period of time something else is supposed to happen. It may be driven underground. That is, the true church may be driven underground. The church may be on the defense. A time of intense persecution, perhaps global persecution. And you know what? I'm going to take it into another level here. Instead of it just being direct, dire persecution, it may just be influence. We are under a demonic influence in this short period of time. Where we're beginning to rationalize. And you know what helped us make this decision? Because we listen to people on television who are respectable pastors tell us that it doesn't matter what religion you're in, you're still saved. Well, if that's the case, and it doesn't matter if you're really a, uh, 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 whether you're straight or, or gay. Well, I, I, well okay, if, if every religion is saved, then every sinner is saved too. So it doesn't matter what you do. In fact, I can I can get up in the pulpit and, 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 and come out of the closet and let everybody know and, and, and dare somebody to challenge me. You see how the influence starts? It starts by changing our, our mind. In our mind, we know that there's only one 
Jesus. We know that there's, there's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. We know that. But then somebody we respect begins telling us something different. And then we see the, 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 ch the shift in the world. Oh my gosh, that church over there has 4,000, 10,000, 20,000 people going to it. And the pastor in there is okay with the gays getting married. In fact, he's doing it in his church. I'm going to go where... Because there's so many people over there, the Holy Spirit must be there. You see how this happens? Mm -hmm. And what's the devil doing? Jumping. Sitting there laughing. Yeah. Jumping up and down with glee. Now, the real remnant church, the one who's trying to live in holiness and sanctification, not perfect, but working on their sanctification. The one who's telling people they need to repent. The one who's reminding people that there is a hell that you might go to. What are they doing? They're laughing at them. And because our, our churches don't have that many people in them, then to the world we look what? Foolish. Dead. Dead. You see how this can connect? What I'm, what I'm trying to say we're having right now might be connecting to what we're reading about here. And they're laughing at us. They're challenging us. We get on YouTube. We get on Facebook. We try to give a message telling the truth. And what do they do? They block us. They ban us. They shadow ban us. They might even say you can't post anything for a week or a month. I've been, I've experienced both. They banned me for for a whole month. I wasn't allowed to put anything on one of my pages. What have you preached? It started a few years ago. It wasn't what I was saying. A few years ago, it used to tell you how many people uh, looked at your your page. And back around, I guess it was 2016, 2017. Believe it or not, I had 40 to 60,000 people every time I post who was watching what I was saying. Wow. Facebook didn't like that. Because I wasn't paying to advertise my page. And I'm getting that much... Notice that what they do, they started blocking. What they did, they didn't necessarily block me, but they blocked all the people who were following me from seeing what I was posting. It's called shadow banning. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Well, that happens. Now, it's interesting. Because it says in verse 7 of what we just read, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them. If we're talking about two individuals, do you make war between two people? No. You just go out and arrest them. You don't send the tanks to just conquer two guys. The two individuals are an army, and the beast... As his army, and there's a spiritual warfare between the powers of darkness and the church, and it would appear that the church is defeated, or it appears to be so, but this wouldn't last long. The world finally thinks it got rid if this of this pesk if if this pesky conscience that has been bugging them for so long. Oh, finally got we finally got rid of them. They're gone. Hallelujah! They celebrate, but they do it to their own chargon. Jesus comes back, he raises up the church, he raptures the church, and notice what happens here in verse 13. Mm, We're back at Revelation hour. eleven thirteen. 13. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, let's break this down. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. It could be an emblem of the end of the world. It's in the same hour. Jesus talked about the final hour. Remember he said in John 5, 28, in that hour, all the dead will come forth and hear his voice. 
Remember he said that? And it says here, a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. This is a symbolic number. It's a total large number, seven. To say seven means it's total. If you say 7,000, what do you think that means? Totality. Apparently the total number of those opposed to God. And what does it say next? The rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Some get saved apparently who had not apparently heard the gospel. In any case, I believe that this is a summary of the age of the church. This is what I see Revelation 20 also describing. It only is using different images. Then we have what we have already read. That this is the sounding of the seventh trumpet in verses 15 and 18, which is the second coming of Christ. In verse 14, it says, The second woe is past. Behold, a third woe is coming quickly. Now let's read about the seventh trumpet. Someone read verses 15 through 18. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones tell, fell on their faces and worshipped God. Verse 17 and 18 as well. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Having come to that, we would think that we don't need any more on this subject of the three and a half years. Uh, we're told two things about it. Number one, Jerusalem is trampled on underfoot at the time, at this time. Number two, that the church is witnessing for Christ at, that, at this time. But after closing down the section of the trumpet with the giving of the seventh trumpet, it's like it's the end of the segment. It's like chapters 10 and 11 are mostly the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. But now we have come to the end. It's like it's time to get back to the next thing. But instead of doing that, we have two more chapters about this three and a half year period. The question is asked, why is the seventh trumpet in the middle of this segment? The little book, if this little book is all about one thing, why is it that the end is right here in the middle? I don't know, church. They didn't consult me when they put this together. But it looks to me as this is the natural close of this little book, but there is an appendix. Oh, by the way, there's more about this. There, there's more about this period of time. A woman flees in the wilderness. There's this cool war in heaven. Satan is thrown out of heaven. And there are two beasts, and they have significance to the church. So, again... This is not in chronological order, and that's where a lot of the interpreters have made such mistakes. It's not understanding that this is not in chronological order. Now, let's read verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And it's in the temple here in heaven. So this would seem to suggest that the church is raptured and John sees the temple which was preserved and measured at the beginning of chapter 11 is now in heaven. There is standard lightning, thundering, noises, earthquakes, a great hail. We have the list of these things which began in chapter 5, which were lightnings, thunders, and noises. And it progressed later to those things and earthquakes, and now it's, it, 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 it's all of them, and there's a great hail that's included. There's a mounting dramatic element here. These images of judgment are getting more extreme and severe as the book goes on. Now, 
you read this and you may say, this must be the end of the story. If Jesus is returning, won't that be the end? It will, it will be when it really happens. But here, this is not the end of the book. Because in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, we go back and we talk about the birth of Jesus and some of the things that happen after his ascension. In chapter 12, verse 5, the child who is Jesus is caught up to God and to his throne, but there's more. What happens after that? Well, the woman flees in the wilderness. The woman is the remnant of Israel. The church is New Jerusalem who flees from the impending judgment. As Jesus told them, God preserved them here, even though he's destroying the city from which they fled. And we're going to talk about all of this as we get into chapter 12. Now, my question is, do you want to start chapter 12? Or do you want to stop? We've got about uh, maybe 10 minutes. What would you like to do? You want to start chapter 12? Do we have time to do the introduction of chapter 12? Uh, we might could. Yeah. Let's go ahead. What we just did considered in chapter 11, we finally came to the seventh trumpet being sounded. My belief, and this is not everybody's, is that the seventh trumpet is the second coming of Christ in the end of the world. What Paul called the last trump. Between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, we saw that there was a new era. Beyond that which has been considered in the book seems to be introduced. The introduction of the little book. In chapter 10, we looked at reasons to consider the little book is not talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Things that were not going to happen shortly or things that were confined to just Israel. And as I mentioned, it's my view that most of Revelation is about those subjects. But there is this section right in the middle, a separate prophecy that was about many peoples, many nations, tongues, and kings. And then we come to this section, chapters 11, 12, and 13. In chapter 11, we're introduced to a period of time which is called in verse 2, 42 months. In verse 3, it's mentioned again as 1,260 days. Futurist believes that this speaks of a tribulation period. Dispensationalists of the normal sort believe that there are two three-and-a-half-year periods that make up a total seven-year tribulation period in the future. Now, preterists usually identify this period of three-and-a-half-year period with some past literal period of that length. Possibly the persecution conducted by Nero, which was about the length of the Jewish war, which was about that length. Uh, th those are different sets of calamities. But the point is, futurists look for more of a literal three and a half years, or three and a half times two. And it's all future. Preterists look for a three and a half years from the past related to the fall of Jerusalem. They consider... The whole book is talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Now, as I said before, I've departed from that normal preterist view on this particular part. Uh, historicist, which you will not hear from unless you go to a Seventh-day Adventist church, uh, they, they view it uh, even more different, um, which used to be, I will say this view, the historicist view, was the main view of Protestants back uh, in the 16 and 1700s. Uh, they believed that the three and a half years should be broken down into days, 1,260, and each day should represent a year. So they believed the period was 1,260 years. And they say it largely was applicable to the age of the papacy and the beast, whose blasphemies continue for many, many years. So they believed that this period was the whole career of the Roman Catholic Bishop of Rome. Well, if you go back and look at history, when was the first pope put into his position? Peter was. Well, the first Catholic pope. The, the, the first, it was Pope Gregory, and it wasn't until about 600 that they actually put him in place. The church was around for few hundred years before they actually began a pope. 
And that, if you count up 600 until about the year 1860, that would give you your 1,260 years. Well, did the Catholic Church cease to exist in the year 1860? No. no. Now you know why there aren't as many historists as they used to be. Because that was their main, that, that's what was their main dif uh, difference between other interpreters. Um, 1860 came and went and the Pope still exists. It is the idealist that sees this passage as the way I do. Idealists view that the number of three and a half years or 42 months or 1,260 days or time times and half a time, all of those are essentially talking about a period of time that symbolically represents something. The real time in question is not like anything like a three and a half year period. And I've suggested that this time period calls to mind the ministry of Jesus. Therefore, it's a, a symbolic designation as Jesus was cut off in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel. There's another half week not accounted for. It's possible that Revelation is hinting that the half week is the unfinished min ministry of Jesus, which is done by who? The church. We are fulfilling the unfinished mystery of, uh, ministry of Jesus. Uh, this would suggest that the 42 months is the same period as the age of the church. Not exactly, because we have evidence that it began in 70 A.D. Well, when did the church begin? 40 years before that. In 30 A.D. It is the age of the church minus the first 40 years. So the primary reason I gave for this is that we're told in Revelation 11.2 that the Gentiles would trample on the holy city of Jerusalem for 42 months. And Jesus said that the Gentiles would trample on the holy city of Jerusalem until the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled. In Luke chapter 21 verse 23, he said that. He's talking about the fall of Jerusalem, the treading down of Jerusalem by the Gentiles. It sounds to me by this statement that Jesus is talking about the rest of the church age. The time that God is bringing the Gentiles in. He gave the Jews almost 1,500 years under the old covenant to get it right. And did they get it right? No. They did not. Now he's given the Gentiles their chance. Testing that theory, we saw that the two witnesses, if they're viewed as the church... They're witnessing for the same period of time, 1,260 days. And at the end of their testimony, though they experience a brief defeat at the hands of the beast, yet they're finally vindicated and brought up into heaven as the church will be at the end of the church age. So while we would say that the matter is not established beyond question, we have at least a plausible suggestion that the 1,260 days stands from the period from the destruction of Jerusalem to the second coming of Christ. We saw that the seventh trumpet sound at the end of chapter 11 and that it is the end of the world, if I am correct in what I'm thinking. But in chapter 12, we go back to an earlier period again. And Revelation does this. There's overlapping visions that overlap each other um, chronologically unparalleled to each other in time. And it gives us different aspects of the same period. Perhaps it's the failure to, to see this that causes dispensationalists to believe that there will be a seven-year tribulation, which is never mentioned in Scripture. But by thinking that the three-and-a-half-year period that we're considering now in chapter 12 and 13 is a different three-and-a-half-year period than the one we saw in chapter 11. It's my understanding that all the references to three and a half year period are referring to the same period. There's not more than one. And that every vision that has to do with that period gives us a different new, uh, nuance, a different angle of what is going on. What God is doing and what is happening during that time and what the devil is also doing during the same period of time. In chapter 12, we will see this period mentioned twice. These two times mentioned are seen as parallel to each other instead of sequential to each other. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, we'll see that the woman fled into the wilderness where she has, played, has a place prepared for her by God. 
that they would feed her there for 1,260 days. We'll see that this chapter has a parenthesis in the middle of it. And it picks up the story at the same spot again, down in verse 14. In fact, if you want to, let's do a quick reference. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. We'll read this again later, but while we're on this subject right now. That the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now, we will find that verse 6 brings us to the flight of a woman in the wilderness for this time. And then it breaks off at this parenthesis at verse 7. And it talks about things going on in the heavenly realm. It tells us of the dragon being cast out of heaven. It tells us that once it's been cast out, it picks up at the story of the woman again, repeating the same information that we had in verse 6. So we have this passage of a woman going off into the wilderness... Broken by a parenthetical a, 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 a section that tells us something that was going on in heaven. So, I'm saying this, and you may say, why are you being so technical? If you are looking at Revelation in a chronological aspect, and you don't realize that there's parentheses... Then as you're reading it, you might get lost and think that this is something else when you're when in essence all that was was a parenthesis and now you're going back into what you just were in. Okay? We're going to experience this in chapter 12. And again, just for emphasis, and this will be my concluding point, what we're about to start in Revelation chapter 12 is the same time period. That we just got finished in chapter 11. In chapter 11, it was called 42 months and three and a half years. Now we're getting into the same time period, and, but it's not going to be talking necessarily about the two witnesses. It's not going to be talking about what we talked about in chapter 11. It's going to be talking about who this woman is and what was going on with her during this time period. Okay. So okay. 12 explains. 12 is going to explain who this woman is. Mm -hmm. Or it don't really explain who it is. In studying, you figure out who it is. But the, 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 it, it's giving us the what, what, what goes on with this woman. Who is she? Is she the church? Who is, who is, who is the, 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 the child, the baby? Who is the dragon? What does this, her going into the wilderness, what did that represent? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. And it's going to get interesting because we have some Old Testament references to some of this. There's a, there's a verse here in Luke. Uh -huh. it's, it's when Jesus was going... Right before he was crucified. Right. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the, and fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? That's Jesus speaking. Now, you want to know what that was? What it was is Jesus was talking about what happened to Jerusalem. In the fall of, in in the fall 70, of it. fall of it. Seventy. In 70 AD. That would happen in 40 years. So he was talking to women who 40 years from now would probably maybe have grandchildren. Their daughters would be weeping over their babies. Don't weep for me. Right now, I came in here and I cleaned all the demons out of Israel. Right now. I 
came in here and I set you all straight. I put you in the right direction. The tree is green right now. And if they're going to treat me this way while things are green, whenever judgment comes upon you, things aren't going to be green. There's going to be a lot more demons having control over the situation. Josephus told us, God, I mean, he, 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 yeah, he told that's what he was saying. That's what he was saying. Don't weep for me, because what your children and your grandchildren are going to go through is going to be a whole lot worse than what I'm going through. And expect it, because if they're doing this to me now, what your, what your children and grandchildren are going to go through is going to be worse. And it was. And it happened. He already knew. Why do you think he spent all night crying over Jerusalem a, a day or two before that? Why couldn't you accept me? I tried to gather you in like a hen gathers her chicks. Mm -hmm. That was the last opportunity they had. Now, as a nation, that was their last opportunity. That doesn't mean that individual Jews, even today, cannot accept him and have the same position we have. But as a nation, Jerusalem would no longer be his headquarters. I got a question. 21. Uh, 23, 23, 21. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. This, um, these chapters that seem to deal with the end of time that are right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. Couldn't they have been misplaced by the translator? Uh, I don't know. Um, it is possible, the, you know, I, I'm going to say this about the Bible. The Bible was not divided up into chapters. Did you know that? When yeah. it was, the scrolls were not written, they were not divided up into chapters. Absolutely not. They took the scrolls and they, they divided it up into where they felt was the stopping point. Right. And we have, in studying other books of the Bible, I'm not sure if it was Hebrews or if it was, it was one of the New Testament epistles. Uh, I, I made reference to this and I can't remember which one it was. It might have been Colossians. That actually the next... There was another book of the... I can't remember which one it was. It's been a while. One of the books that starts out in the New Testament should have been the end of, the, of, the, of, a, of another book. The, the, the ones who coordinated how they placed it uh, put it in the wrong place. That doesn't make it invalid. It doesn't make it, uh, you know, not... It, it's just... And once it got established to be there... It was hard to change it then, because then people would be like, "Oh, you messing with the Bible, you know." <laughs> so they kind of had to leave it there like that. But the Bible was put in the orders and and and, and how things were put. Um, but when you look at overall revelation, this may not have necessarily been a mistake because what we talked about up until chapter ten. And then you look at what happens after chapter, and starting with chapter 14. Again, it's like we're going back over what we did in the early part, but it's, it's coming in a, in a, from a different direction and a different view. So it may have been done that way on purpose. The Holy Spirit may have put it in that order for John. Is he, got, he gave them the vision of the fall of Jerusalem. Then he gives us the vision of what would happen after the fall of Jerusalem, with the church age. But then he he comes back later and goes over some of the fall of Jerusalem from a different angle. I don't know. I, I honestly can't tell you if if the translators put this in, 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 in the same order as they found it or if this is how they found it. I don't know. But, you know, it would be interesting for people who are futurists who are trying to put all this in chronological order and make sense of it. <laughs> they could have put that in the middle because they thought it was applying to something else. 
It, it is possible. But I wasn't around several hundreds of years ago when this may have happened. Right. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I honestly couldn't tell you. So, but I, like I said, I've made this comment before even tonight I made it. Why is this here? Don't, don't ask me. I wasn't there. They didn't get my opinion of it when they were putting it together. <laughs> All I know is we take it as it is and God still gives us his spirit and allows us to understand it. Okay, so we're going to close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a good God. We thank you for being the God you are. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for being able to put make something in this, Father, and Yes, we talked about some deep things tonight. Uh, some of these things may be applying to our time period. In fact, we know that they're applying to our time period. And there are things going on within the body of Christ. There's things that's happened. There's things, Father, that is, is, is disturbing in, in, in all truth. But, Father, we, we ask that you help us to take what we have and to, uh, and to be uh, cognizant of it to stay awake and to not be dismayed by what, what goes on, to keep our faith strong and fortified because, Father, someone has to still be the light. Uh, there, there have always, ever since the, uh, that, that covenant was first made with Moses, Father, there has always been a remnant who was faithful to you. And all the disobedience that has taken place with the Israelites in the Old Covenant and even the disobedience, Father, of those in the new covenant in the church, there's always been a faithful remnant. And, Father, that's what we aspire to be is your remnant. We aspire, Father, to, to act in holiness, to do what's right. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We sometimes even commit sins. But, Father, we pray for your forgiveness. We pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father... For, for your hand in all that we do because it's your work, it's your, your power and it, it has nothing, Father, to do with us. It's your glory. Thank you, Father, for everyone that's here tonight. We pray for those who are not able to be here. We pray for those who are sick and tired and going through hardships. We pray for Brother Ray. Uh, he was in the hospital this morning. We pray, Father, um, or actually it was yesterday. We pray, Father, that you give him rest, that you give him peace, and that you help him, Father, with what he needs. We give you all glory, all honor, all praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen.